Hello again, this is Pastor Ed Collins. This is part two of Proverbs 17 Wisdom. Fantastic set of principles before us. I do want to say before we begin, though, uh, we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper at the end of this message. So pause this video now, if it makes sense, to get your elements ready so you don't have to at the end. Okay? All right, with that said, let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this incredible privilege of doing this very thing, Father. Being blessed out by you, just having the ability to take in the Word of God the way that we have been able to as a congregation, as a family, Father, as children of yours. We're so very grateful, Father. We just pray that we never become familiar with it, but be spiritually invigorated by it even that we're so encouraged by your faithfulness father that it flows through us by means of grace that it comforts us and as it overflows in our own lives we might bring glory to you by bringing that grace and comfort to others father speaking of we do pray for those in the congregation that need comfort that need encouragement at this point that are suffering uh, in some way shape or form father god only you only know really uh, to what extent that's occurring in an individual soul father but we do pray that if your will be done we might be used as instruments of righteousness to your glory to comfort them show us the way father also we pray for those that are still lost in this world, that are without hope, that are destitute of eternal life, Father, that they're destined for the lake of fire. We just pray that they be humbled and receive saving faith, Father, before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make a time like this, a beautiful moment like this, a time of rejoicing, a time of giving thanks, Father. May we never become familiar with these moments. We do just ask for your blessings on this message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, this is part two of Proverbs 17 Wisdom. Uh, this message will make a lot more sense, obviously, if you pick up the first part which was uh, Thursday, this Thursday. Speaking of, we began reading Proverbs 17 last time. And as I shared with you, it all started with my daily reading, something that I really try to do every day over a cup of coffee, first thing in the morning when my mind is ready for it, when I'm just fresh. Uh, I really do recommend that for all of you. Just wake up. 10 or 15 minutes earlier, or, or half an hour if you, if you can do it, you know, so you can spend some time in the Word of God. It just situates you so well for the rest of the day. And just as a hint, daily reading often results in the most profound realizations. Most of the time, I would say the vast majority of the, of the blogs that I write come as a result of my reading the Bible and it's not even related necessarily to these messages that I have to teach you. It's just my own reading. Of course, they dovetail, as you have seen over the years. But nonetheless, it's because of the daily reading that so many profound realizations occur in the soul. So that's just uh, some additional encouragement for you. We do want to review what we covered on Thursday and press on a bit more in this magnificent chapter. In Holy Scripture, go to Proverbs 17, verse 1. Proverbs 17, verse 1. Again, fantastic principles. I'm really excited about this, this series that we're starting here. Just so much wisdom from the Spirit as of late. Just so much connective tissue to our lives. Again, Proverbs 17, verse 1, this is a review. I think we got through the first three verses last time. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. The Spirit immediately turned our attention 
last Thursday to a topic that many of you hearing my voice have struggled with in the past, or maybe do even currently, if you're honest, right? And that's money. As the 80s pop star Cindy Lauper once sang, money changes everything. My family would be laughing at me right now. <laughs> but nonetheless, she sang once, money changes everything. And you know what? She's right. Why? Because, frankly, fundamentally, money, what? It buys you stuff. That's what money does. It buys you stuff. And without the right perspective on said stuff, you become entangled by it. Here's how we can kickstart this message up here on the board. We humans have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from, don't we? Yeah, we have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. Go to Deuteronomy 6 verse 10. We're going to look at Old Testament because there's nothing new under the sun. People have been people since the dawn or since the fall in the garden. And so we can look at any point in human history in the Bible and find the same elements of the human flesh and its wretchedness. Deuteronomy 6 verse 10. Again, the point on the board, our first key point, we have two key points we're going to focus on in this message. The first one is we have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. Deuteronomy 6.10 Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, key point, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Talk about grace, right? And what does he say? Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. How quickly we forget. Be careful you don't forget where you came from, where the Lord delivered you from. Again, the point on the board, we humans have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. So let's read a little bit more in Deuteronomy. Go to verse uh, 20 of chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. We see a history of this. And why would we be surprised? And we certainly shouldn't be judgmental in any way. Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. If we're honest, we can look in the mirror in most of this stuff, uh, on most of this stuff and say, yeah, I too have become familiar. I too have taken all the grace that God has given me over the years and I have become familiar. <laughs> I've forgotten where I've come from, which really was, I was on a vector heading straight for hell. Deuteronomy 31, 20. For when I bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and spurn me and break my covenant. Think about this. So God does all this stuff by grace for his people. And what do they do? They turn to other gods and serve them and they spurn him the giver, and they break his covenant. Incredible. How about one more passage on this topic on the board? Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Go there. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Just around the corner. Again, this is all about our habit of becoming familiar and forgetting where we came from. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him. And there was no foreign god with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth. And he ate the produce of the field. And he made him suck honey from the rock. And oil from the flinty rock. Curds of cows and milk of the flock. With fat of lambs and rams. The breed of Bashan and goats. With the finest 
of the wheat, and of the blood of grapes you drank wine. And then in comes, looks sounds like a pretty good life, doesn't it? And then in comes, guess what? Familiarity. Look at verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. Can you believe that? That's the pattern of humanity. We're awful. God gives us everything by grace. He saves us. And then we spurn him. We turn our backs on him. We're, we're awful. It's ugly. Again, the point we're establishing, though, is that we humans, the point on the board, we humans have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. And it's, you know, quote, funny, not ha-ha, because when push comes to shove, we value our lives more than anything, don't we? Let's just get a little perspective going now. What about all this? I mean, how do we, it's not like we don't value our lives. At one point in our lives, we valued it enough that we gave it over to the Lord for him to save us, right? And so up here on the board, Ephesians 5, 29, verse A, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. It's not like we don't like our own flesh. Now, since we value our lives so much, we do everything in our power to protect it. Fair statement. We value our lives so much, we do everything in our power to protect it. At salvation, for example, the biggest decision was based on eternal life. Right? We want to protect that. We want that thing. We want eternal life. That's what salvation was all about. And also having it secured by means of grace. This makes total sense given the value that we place on our own lives and our own livelihoods. So when we were destitute and in need, this is the point, when we were destitute and in need, we had no problem reaching out, you know, or, or answering God's grace, you know, in humility. Well, I value my life enough. I understand what the options are here. Okay, I'm with you, Lord. We had no problem doing that in terms of, you know, even self-preservation in a sense. Go to Luke 9.24 for just a little bit more on that. The Spirit's developing something here, so uh, just keep everything on the table in front of you. Again, we value our lives. Um, you know, no one, as the point in the board says in Ephesians 5.29a, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. How about Luke 9.24? For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? That's the thing. You know, I valued my life enough as a believer. I valued my life enough to hand it over to God. And in that sense, he saved me. I didn't forfeit myself for the world, in other words. I didn't want to gain the whole world and forfeit my soul. Why? Because I valued my soul above really anything else. I valued my life, you see. So ask yourself, how grateful were you to God when the Spirit informed you that you were saved? Think about that. You value your life, presumably, right? You valued it enough to give it over, to hand it over, so that you could have eternal life given to you, right? How grateful were you to God when the Spirit let you know that you were saved? It's the greatest realization in human history. And yet, why have we become so familiar with Him? So He graces us out beyond anything we even read in Deuteronomy just now. All the physical stuff and the blessings. Beyond that, He gives us eternal life. Why do we become so familiar with him? Why do we turn our backs on him? Why do we scoff at those people in Deuteronomy, but yet here we are with the greatest grace gift called salvation, and we forget about it. We act like little brats. Why have we become so familiar with him and his precious grace? Why do our actions speak differently than our mouths? I mean, most of us talk a really big game, but... Isn't the proof in the pudding, as they say? All right. With that said, let's go back to our primary passage. Go to Proverbs 17.1. You might as well put a marker in Proverbs 17 because we're going to go back and forth there. 
uh, for the foreseeable future. Proverbs 17, verse 1. Again, we haven't even got out of the starting. We're just getting out of the starting block here with verse 1. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Again, money changes everything. That's at the root of this statement. Why? Again, because money buys you stuff. And if you lose perspective of said stuff, you become entangled by it. And when this happens, we are sitting ducks easily picked off by the kingdom of darkness. Why? Up here again. We humans have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. You see? We get stuff, we get our minds set on stuff, and all of a sudden it becomes about stuff. We forget about where we came from. We forget about just what we just reflected on in terms of salvation and receiving his grace for eternal life. We look at it as something in the past, and it's, what have you done for me lately? We humans have a really bad habit of forgetting where we came from. That's, that's the answer to the question. So, this is the warning we see in Proverbs 17.1. Jesus stated this a little different, uh, differently when he said this, Luke 12.34, up here on the board. For you, where your treasure is, there you, will your heart also be, or be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <sighs> Our heart was with God at salvation, right? Think about it. You probably had a, a spike in a, in even maybe emotionalism or love um, when you thought about being saved. Your heart was his, with him in that moment. What happened? What's happened since then? Thankfully, wisdom repeats herself throughout the Bible on this topic of money and wealth. Go to Psalm 49, verse 1. We'll read a little bit more on this. Psalm 49, verse 1. Thank be to God that wisdom repeats herself. Psalm 49, verse 1. 49, 1 reads, Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world both low and high, rich and poor together. In other words, no distinction. I'm, I'm just talking doctrine here, says wisdom. My mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. Why should I fear in days of adversity, when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me? Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches... Why would I fear that? Verse 7, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever. That he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. For he sees that even wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names. That is folly. But man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. Verse 13, this is the way of those who are foolish. Trying to make a name for yourself based on, you know, wealth or compiling wealth or, you know, even... Things like naming buildings after yourself, that kind of stuff. This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words. Salah. Again, the point of the board, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let's read some Holy Scripture to drive this home. Again, go to Proverbs 11.24. Proverbs 11.24. And keep, remember, keep that uh, tab on Proverbs 17 because we're going to bounce back and forth. Proverbs 11:24 reads, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Only suffers want. That's the person who has uh, an, aff an affinity for, an affection for money instead of actually what counts. So one who gives freely, yet grows all the richer. 
Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Now's a good time to inject the following old secular proverb. The things you own end up owning you. That's really good wisdom. The things you own end up owning you. And that's especially applicable for those of you who can't or do not have the capacity for wealth. That's literally what we just read in Proverbs 11:24. One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. That's what it means to be owned. Do you see? When you're busy just compiling for the sake of compiling because you've, you've forgotten where you came from. Now it's about the money. It's about the wealth. It's about the prosperity. You're the one who suffers in the end. Those things own you. Why, here's the question, now we're getting to the sort of the uh, brass tacks here. Why does this happen? Why does it happen? We see that it happens. It's not, a, it's not a novel idea. We just read about it in the Old Testament. Why does it happen? I mean, not every wealthy person has this problem, though even Solomon admitted that he had bouts with it, as did Job from time to time. Let me summarize something. This is really important, so pay attention, please. Let me summarize some biblical wisdom for you on this topic up here on the board. And I'm using that phrase, money changes everything. I hope you get what I'm getting at there. Here's the point. Wealth should first be considered a test long before it should ever be considered a blessing. That makes sense? Wealth should first be considered a test long before it should ever be considered a blessing. If you can't get past the test, there's no way you're going to be blessed by having money. <laughs> if you can't get past the test, if the first thing that happens when you, get, when you come into some wealth or some money or something like that, is all of a sudden it becomes about the money. You're fixated on the money. You've lost, you failed the test. Then the blessing is gone. If you can't get past the test, there's no way you're going to be blessed by having money. In other words, wealth should, be, should first be considered a test long before it should ever be considered a blessing. The world will whisper in your ear, Oh, no, no, you just need a little more, that's all. So keep striving after that money. Eventually, it pays dividends. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Here's what the Bible has to say on this. Go to Psalm 62, verse 7. Psalm 62, verse 7. The Bible has an awful lot to say on this thing. And it's all about attitude, you see. Psalm 62, verse 7. Psalm 62, 7 reads, On God my salvation and my glory rest. On God my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Salah. Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than breath. Do not trust in oppression, and do not vainly hope in robbery. Here we go. If riches increased, do not set your heart upon them. If riches increased, do not set your heart upon them. That's grand wisdom right there. If you come into money, say, I don't know, maybe you get a new job, or you get a promotion, or... I don't know, Uncle Jimmy dies and you get an inheritance. I don't know. You get something, you just come into money. Don't make it about the money. Don't look at it that way. Again, this is the point on the board. Wealth should be first considered a test long before it should ever be considered a blessing. To echo our previous point, we humans fail the test because we forget where we came from. We forget where we came from. We, get, we build an affinity for shiny new objects, in other words. Stuff that money can buy. And we, we Americans are famous for this. Again, we humans fail the test because we forget where we came from. As awful as it sounds, we become familiar with God's salvation. 
we become like entitled little brats. And that hurts just to say. We become like entitled little brats. Familiar with God's salvation? Really? Yep. By the grace of God, we are cautioned. Go to Proverbs 23, verse 4. Proverbs 23, verse 4. By the grace of God, we are given messages like this. I hope you're grateful for these kinds of messages. It's, it, these are incredibly well placed in our souls. You need to hear them. You need to be reminded of these things. Proverbs 23, verse 4 reads, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Some of you could stop right there and think on that all day, all weekend. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Some of you have sacrificed friends, family, church, oh my goodness, reading the Bible even. What are you thinking? Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. Stop just right there. Cease. Boom. Cut it. Cut it off. Boom. Right there. Just cease from your consideration of doing that thing. When you set your eyes on it, it's gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings, like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. That's the trap. You think you're chasing after it, but you're chasing after the wind. This is precisely what Solomon wrote about in the book of Ecclesiastes. Go to Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, right around the corner. Just go forward a little bit. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Solomon, full of wisdom, wrote on this very topic. Remember, he was very rich, too. So he knew what he was talking about. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. What does he conclude? He says in first, verse 10 here, he says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Ah, ooh, that's just awful, isn't it? It's awful. Think about that. You're in, it's like a, it's one of those messed up love triangle things, right? It's like you're in love with something that you can't be satisfied with. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. That that's like sounds just awful. Nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Incredible wisdom from Solomon. And again, what is vanity like according to Solomon? Up here on the board, Ecclesiastes 1.14. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. Yeah, it's vanity. It's vain to chase after wealth. It's called striving after the wind. And I love that statement because when's the last time you were able to catch the wind? <laughs> Go outside. You know, pause the video. Go outside when the wind's blowing. See if you can catch some of that wind. <laughs> That's silly talk, right? Well, let me get serious with you for a moment. You have a better chance of catching the wind than happiness through wealth. You have a better chance of catching the wind than happiness through wealth. Fair enough conclusion based on the word of God? I think so. And by the way, I'm not alone in my statement there either. Go to Ecclesiastes 6.1. Ecclesiastes 6 verse 1. Definitely not alone in the statements I'm making. Ecclesiastes 6 verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. And this is especially prevalent, as we're going to see, in America. Verse 2, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity in a severe affliction. What was Solomon getting at here? I need you to concentrate because the context is super important here. Okay, A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet, so God gives him these riches, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them. For a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and severe affliction. So concentrate. I need you to understand the context of this passage in order for you to glean from it the pearls of wisdom. So listen closely, please. Solomon was essentially saying that 
God will ordain wealth for people, but not give them the capacity for it. This isn't always the case, but it happens. And he does it on purpose. Solomon was essentially saying that God will ordain wealth for people, but not give them the capacity for it. Okay, wait a minute. Did I just describe the average American? Did I just describe the average American? How many Americans can you point to, starting to the one in the mirror, that doesn't wield a sense of entitlement to their American wealth? How many can you point to, starting with yourself, that don't wield a sense of entitlement to your American wealth or to their American wealth? I'll let you answer that for yourself. Suffice to say that Americans are basically a bunch of spoiled brats. And I've been all over the world, literally, all around the globe. And it's no wonder the rest of the world mocks us for being fat cats. Well, we are the fair subjects of Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes 6.1. That's the point. There is an evil which I have seen. Look at verse 1 again. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun and is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. That's pretty much America. Yet God has not empowered him to eat from them for a foreigner enjoys them. In other words, the Americans have all this stuff, but they don't have the capacity to actually enjoy it. Just think about that. In other words, if, if, that, if, if what I'm saying is not true, then why, is every, why are most Americans complaining about not having enough? Why are most people, you know, crumbling at the first sight of, what, some kind of a shutdown because of some disease that's poking its head around? What's wrong with people? The, the truth is what verse 2 says. God has given Americans extreme wealth relative to the rest of the world. But yet, most, most Americans don't have the capacity for it, apparently. In other words, God gives wealth to those without capacity for it. Namely, lots of Americans. Now, <laughs> Here's the question. Why would he do such a thing? Well, I'm not God, so he only knows the full truth of it. But based on the Bible, we can conclude that it at least proves how susceptible we are to the love of money. How quickly our minds turn towards stuff, stuff that wealthy Americans can afford to buy. I, I think about that often. I mean, we've got Folks spending five, six dollars on some kind of frappuccino or something that I can't even name because the name is too long. It's too obnoxious. And there are some people who would take that six dollars and feed their entire family of five or six or seven, say in India, for the day. It's incredible. And we complain because what? The 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 frothy milk? <laughs> wasn't spiked enough with some extra hit of caffeine. I don't know. We're ridiculous. Oh, we can't get to it now. We can only go through drive throughs because of this shutdown thing. Oh, 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 isn't that just awful? No, it's ridiculousness. Again, I'm not God, but based on the Bible, what we conclude is that this proves how susceptible we are to the love of money, which is Paul wrote about is the root of all kinds of evil in 1 Timothy 6.10, as we'll get to in a moment. We, we are like walking Proverbs. Just put that into perspective. Most Americans are like walking Proverbs against Ecclesiastes 6, verse 2. God gave a bunch of blessing, and nobody seems to have the capacity for it. It's disgusting. They don't even thank God for it. They don't even look to God for it. That proves that they don't have capacity for it. Okay, go back to Proverbs 17, uh, verse 1 now. Proverbs 17, verse 1. I hope you have your marker there so I can go quickly. All of this from one verse. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. We have to learn up here on the board. American fools. This is what we have to learn. Amer we Americans have our priorities screwed up. Our priorities are screwed up. The world throws a little money at us and we turn into prostitutes. What do I got to do to get more of that? 
But yet we, we read in Mark 8.36, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? We Americans have our priorities screwed up. The world throws a little money at us and we turn into prostitutes. Sadly, sadly, some of us, some of them people uh, are believers. Yeah. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? I mean, as we learned last time, or we noted from last time, even a little birdie knows better than most Americans. Up here on the board, Proverbs 1, 17, verse to 18. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Even a birdie's smarter, smart enough to see traps. Again, I would recommend the following blog. I, I gave this to you last time. I even gave you where you could find it on the website, on, on the publications menu page uh, under the Diary of a Journeyman, uh, Volume 1. The American Dream is a Trap. Read it. Do yourself a favor and read it. Okay, so let's reflect for a moment. What's the Spirit getting at here in this message? Well, for starters, he's saying, quit being familiar with God's salvation. Remember where you came from. If you're a believer, you've got nothing to be striving for when it comes to money. What you should be focusing your attention on is your capacity for it. You don't want to be that walking proverb, in other words. What you should be focusing on is your capacity for whatever God gives you. Here's a perfect analogy. Suppose a little kid comes up to you and says, Can I have some of that delicious Kool-Aid, please? It's summertime and I'm really hot and thirsty. And you look down and you realize they don't have a cup to hold it. How will they ever have their desires quenched if they don't have the capacity to possess that which they seek? How will they have their desires quenched if they don't have the capacity to possess that which they seek. The same goes in the spiritual life. Let's read Paul's words again before we press on in our primary passage. Again, keep that marker in Proverbs 17, 1. 1 Timothy 6, 6. Go there. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. This is Paul now. Same idea, right? Same spirit authored, the same, the same author, right? All scriptures God breathed. 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we, shall be, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. As soon as your eyes go towards the riches into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Okay, go back to Proverbs 17.1. We will press on from there. Proverbs 17, 1, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Here's the principle from last time on this verse. Careful what you sacrifice. Up here on the board. Careful what you sacrifice. Nothing is more valuable than the word of truth. Keep doing what you're doing right now. Do not let the trappings of wealth or money or achieving or chasing after these things, chasing or striving after the wind, right? Take the place of learning the Word of God. Whatever it takes, get the Word of God. Whatever it takes, make sure your calendar is clear, your attitude is clear, um, your motivation is clear. Just clear the plate for the Word of God. Do whatever it takes in your life to make sure you keep on taking in the Word of God. Nothing is more valuable than the Word of Truth. Anything or anyone that takes you away from taking in the Word ought to be hacked out of your life, violently if necessary. Nothing is worth sacrificing your relationship with God, and therefore love. Okay, let's press on. Verse 2, Proverbs 17. A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully, 
and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. The Spirit made a point of pointing out that familiarity doesn't just exist between God's creatures and their Savior, but it manifests at lower levels in time as well. And the most identifiable for most of us, the perfect example of this is with familial relationships, your family. For example, it's common to see entitled children treat their, uh, treat their parents like crap. It, it, I mean, look around. Look, at, look how American children treat their parents nowadays. It's disgusting. It's common to see entitled children treat their parents like crap. Children learn very young how to abuse their parents. And frankly, if you're an abused parent, you've got no one to blame but yourself. God holds you responsible for raising your kids. As soon as a child tries to pull a fast one on you, your job is to squash the idea like a bug. Otherwise, you might have a brat on your hands who will suck you dry in every way they can without even batting an eye. Here's what we looked at last time. Withdrawing from the, quote, parent ATM machine, right? Children of all ages. This isn't just kids in the house. I see this happening with kids that are children that are 40 and 50 and 30 and everything else, everywhere in between, not just teenagers or young children. Children of all ages are users when they expect their parents to always support them financially, emotionally, spiritually, to bend to their child's whims and compromise their integrity to play, you know, pretend with them and endorse their delusional, worldly thinking and actions. It happens. Here's the word of God on this kind of behavior. Romans 2 verse 11. English Standard Version, for God shows no partiality. King James Version, for there is no respect of persons with God. Again, Proverbs 17 2. A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. Here's the point that he made last time. Blood relations means nothing to God in terms of, quote, playing favorites or, excuse me, compromising one's integrity. If anything, listen, if anything, the Bible encourages us to be all the more diligent within our families. <laughs> I mean, you, we're supposed to love them. Not hurt them, not injure them by enabling them, by giving in to them, by saying, yep, ATM is open for service, right? Or, or for a child, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of my parents because they're, they're weak towards me. That's disgusting. We should be more diligent with our families, within our families. Now, here's the, the sad thing. Here's, there's, a, there's a big downfall of failing in this area up here on the board. This is the fruit of partiality when it comes to family. Children who are enabled in their homes grow up to resent their parents. It's true. Children who are enabled in their homes grow up to resent their parents. Eventually they figure it out. Eventually they figure out they got all these issues because the parents are weak. The goal of parenting is to be like our father in heaven who judges impartially. And you know what? We, in humility, love him for it. We love him all the more for it. Imagine if we had a wishy-washy father in heaven. You wouldn't respect him. Matter of fact, you'd resent him. Again, children who are enabled in their homes grow up to resent their parents. The goal of parenting is to be like our father in heaven who judges impartially. And we, in humility, love him all the more for it, even though we are disciplined by him at times. Some of you might be saying to yourselves, Sheesh, I gave my kids everything, and they still resent me. Well, you have your answer. It's on the board. And for children, regarding privileges, you are not entitled to anything unless God decides to give it to you. You're entitled to nothing unless God decides to give it to you. Last time I checked, God loves a cheerful giver. You ripping it out of your parents' wallet or ripping it out of them through guilt or shame or whatever it is, uh, is disgusting, despicable, and you need to stop it. You are not entitled to anything unless God decides to give it to you. Even if your parents are disobedient to God, 
in their vain attempts to accommodate your flesh, God won't tolerate it, and both parties will be punished in the end. Now let's reflect on this, because I've got to close here in a little bit. Between the love of money that we noted in Proverbs 17, big picture now, what's, what's the Spirit doing here in this curriculum, in this new series? Between the love of money that we noted in Proverbs 17, verse 1, and the partiality in families we noted in Proverbs 17, 2, we've got a lot to think about, don't we? Just remember this, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And you know what? There is nothing new under the sun. So let's just step back for a moment. Step back. Think about just those first two verses, right? The love of money, familiarity, partiality, and families. If you step back and really think about it, there's connective tissue between the two topics set before us that are money and the love of it, and partiality. There's connective tissue there. The connective tissue, the common thread, is entitlement. Is entitlement. Think about that over the weekend. Something prevalent in our society today, in our homes even, entitlement. We get familiar with the blessings of God and as a result the blessings turn sour. We get familiar with the blessings of God, and as a result, the blessings turn sour. Whether it's getting familiar with money, or, or parents, or children, we get familiar. We, and then we, all of a sudden we become entitled. Our eyes move, some, our eyes move from being grace-oriented, and, and therefore grateful and thankful, to this awfulness of familiarity and that's when things turn sour instead of rejoicing always we lament over the things we don't have instead of enjoying the privileges of being members of god's family we complain about what our father has chosen not to give us in time and instead of giving thanks we give our giver grief Again, we've got a lot to think about, my friends. So please think about all this as we ready ourselves to partake in the Lord's Supper. Okay, get your elements out. Uh, hopefully, if you have to pause now, do it. But that's why I asked you to pause in the beginning. Okay. So please have bread, a cracker equivalent, and the wine juice equivalent ready to go. You ready? All right, and think about what the Spirit's been saying to us in this message, in this new series, part two of this exciting series on Proverbs 17 wisdom. Can't wait to see what he's going to unfold. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of the person of Jesus Christ. Let's eat the bread. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of his work, let's drink the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the privilege of being alive, of hearing messages like this one, of partaking in wisdom that is truly from you. Father, it's a solemn time in our lives when we're hit with truth that stings, but we're so very grateful in our Humble part, in the humble parts of us, Father, we're just so very grateful for when it happens. And we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing that for us. Thank you for your patience while doing it. And thank you, most of all, for giving us a time to celebrate what your Son, our Lord and Savior, did for us on the cross to make times like this a reality for us. We just 
ask for your blessings as we take everything we've learned here in this moment in time back to the privacy of our souls, to our homes, and then your will be done out to a world that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.